Then when I came up for the chapter on Warren Buffett in 1979, that was my new the moment. Because, so what did I learn from Mr. Buffett in 79? And I asked yourself the question, are those principles still relevant today? Ask yourself the question, so what did I learn from 79? I learned that wealth is created by owning a few, not too many, high quality businesses. Now think about any wealthy person, whether in Barbados, Canada, uh, United States, Australia, and think about whether or not that person you are thinking of would be on five, five these five points. Think about a wealthy person from anywhere in the world. Number one, I suggest to you that that person would own only a few high quality Am I right? Number two, that person would really understand those who miss this. Am I right? Number three, that person would make sure that those few businesses that she or she own are, and I understand, are, we are in strong long-term growth industries. Am I right? Number four, I'm sure that person you're thinking of created his or her wealth by making sure that they use other people's money prudently. But there, there was the use of other people's money. Am I right? And number five, that person you're thinking of creating his or her wealth by simply holding those few businesses for the long run. Am I right? No? Okay, so someone said absolutely. So that, that, that was what I learned from Mr. Buffett in 1979. So I, and then I proposed it on every way the first time you. And they were all outside those five points. So for me, that was simple in terms of being an advisor thereafter. All I had to do when I sat with clients was say to clients, look, everybody I know who has paid the wealth, they didn't buy a bag these five months. I'm your advisor, I think you should apply these five months unless you never get away. So ladies and gentlemen, do you never get away? Because I'm a student of wealth creation and I'm learning. And if you never get away, please, your name is 120 over here. Tell me, I'm a student. Do you never get away? Identify a role model. Who before me has done this job eminently successful? Number two, get the recipe from the role model. And number three, don't change the recipe. Don't put your thumbprint on it. Execute it faithfully. So, armed with that three step program, I thought to myself, who in this world are the people who have done the best job at creating wealth? Because those are the role models that we all should be emulating. If all of us are trying to create wealth, so who are these people? Well, they are successful business people. They are the ones who have done the best job at protecting their capital. They are the ones who have done the best job at getting investing for growth, investing for income, and investing for business to minimize taxes. Successful business people. So whatever formula they use to become successful, to have achieved optimality in those four variables, that's the formula I'm going to adhere to forever, period. So the question was, is there a common factor, is there a common formula between every single successful, wealthy person? Is there such a form common formula? Because if there is such a formula, I want to know, my clients want to know, and I think you want to know, right? So, to have voracious reading, research, I came across it. You need that. And it was in 1979, came across this book entitled The Money Masters. Wouldn't it not make more sense? Wouldn't it not make more sense? And by the way, this behavior, uh, for this way of creating portfolios, is only the same sort of world. It's conventional. So the question is, wouldn't it not make more sense to create portfolios that have more of the characteristics of the more private business world, wouldn't that make more sense? Than this relatively world, wouldn't that make more sense? No? So that's the question that was moving in my mind. So I then asked the credit, I look across the place, and I look at what the pension funds are doing, the entire teachers of the world, the owners of the municipal employer reserve retirement services, the 
CPP, the Harvard, Endowment for the Yale, Endowment for the Carter, the Large Wealth Venture Fund. What are they doing? So before we look at what they're doing, let us ask the question, are there any commonalities between them and your average uh, retail investor? Well, when these entities, these portfolio managers manage, their management mandate are manage to protect the capital portfolio manager onto your teachers. Manage to get income so the teachers of volunteers can have incurred income. Manage to get growth so the teachers of volunteers can have future growth. That's your mandate. But those man three mandates are the same mandates as Jeff and everybody else. Right? Same mandates except minimizing taxes, they're actually so they don't have to use that. Same mandate. So here is the question, yeah, the same question that is challenging conventional paradigm and conventional portfolio uh, asset allocation is that I just described. Here's the second question. If the needs are the same between wealthy institutions, wealthy individuals, and your average less wealthy people, if the needs are the same, should the portfolio asset mix be the same? Pardon me? If the needs are the same, should the portfolio profile be the same? Yes. But is that the case? Is that the case? No. No. So therefore, there is an opportunity. So ladies and gentlemen, you take a look at what Yale Endowment Trust did over the last 18 years. When David Swens took the Yale Endowment Fund over, it was like a typical pension fund. 80% public securities, 20% alternatives. Typical. And had mediocre returns. David Swens, his thesis was, well, his question was, where is it written that a portfolio should be 80% public, 20% alternatives? There's no portfolio allocation theory that can uh, uh, back that up. It's not written anywhere, it's just conventional. So he said, but that doesn't make any sense because Yale has a portfolio, a particular pool, public, uh, public pool, that is 80% between diversified between US securities, US fixed income, US pools of fixed income, US. Uh, stocks and US pools of stocks. And his conclusion was that is not diversification. It is not diversification to a portfolio consisting of Microsoft, consisting of Walmart, consisting of, of Wells Fargo, consisting of virtual assets. That's not diversification as far as data trade was concerned. Diversification because when, when the American market goes down, what happens? They all go down. So what he thought was, his thesis was, True diversification is the spread of your, your, your wealth over one of your companies. True diversification is to find assets that are uncorrelated to what it is you are doing. That are uncorrelated. So find assets. So if you have some money in, in the, the market, which you should, uh, uh, the, the question is how much? You need to now find assets that are uncorrelated those to those public securities. So what are some uncorrelated assets that made sense to him? Well, I went to India, I went to India in November. When we landed in India, we stopped in Turkey. When we got off the plane, I thought, oh my gosh, I thought Turkey was a bunch of bazaars. Right? When I saw Turkey, what I saw here, beautiful country, modern, the airport was super modern. So I said to the handler, the aircraft had a plane. You know what's the airport? So well, this airport is the fourth most busy airport in Europe. In Turkey? Yes! The fourth most busy airport. That was a difference in perception and reality. Secondly, he said, who owned this airport? To my surprise, he said, volunteer teachers. <laughs> What if once you're here? Am I right? Once you're a teacher. So I thought to myself, one moment. This is, this is unbelievable. Because suppose 
a teacher whose portfolio is managed by all the teachers, pension fund managers. Suppose a teacher went to his or her typical pension fund, typical advisor, and said, advisor, at RBC TV by J.P. Morgan, I'd like to buy a Turkish security. What do you think that advisor would say to the teacher? What do you think? Are you mad? But the teacher will be confounded because the teacher is working for me. You are saying I'm mad, but my pension fund managers, they own the airport in Turkey. So who is mad? <laughs> Most clients, their portfolio is consisting of 100% public securities. Most clients. The super wealthy individuals in our society, their portfolio isn't 100% public securities. It's a combination of public and private. But unfortunately, the system is set up in such a way that advisors being a subset of the securities industry, when you sit as an advisor, invariably, you're going to get public securities or some form or fashion of public securities. So I thought, that's wrong. That's fundamentally not right. Because if my portfolio was 100% public, I'd be bankrupt. Going from 39 to 10. I'm lucky that I had this other security that was uncorrelated to the stock market that saved my bacon. Lucky. So now, it, I, I, again, I start thinking further. Let us look at how well it's created by private business people. And if you have a is created by private business owners, these are people who own private business. And let us look at their, their life, their life for the 30 years prior to having a liquidity event, the 30 years prior to them selling their business. 